Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York. To our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On the brief today, Therese Raphael from London and Nigel Farage clearing the way for the Tories. Damien Sassauer on the Hong Kong protests and what it means for China trade. And from Madrid, Maria Tadeo on the results of the Spanish election. So, Therese, thank you very much for being with us. Nigel Farage gave Mr. Johnson something of a break today. Yes, he did. He uh, uh, promised to stand down in 317 seats where uh, the Conservative Party already uh, holds the seat. And this is uh, just over a week after he threatened to put candidates in 600 seats against Conservative voters if Boris Johnson didn't repudiate his own Brexit deal. That was a non-negotiable uh, request for Johnson, uh, who then uh, unleashed a great deal of criticism against Farage basically saying that the Brexit party were going to spoil Brexit uh, if they continue to oppose the Conservatives in these seats. So it's given the Conservatives a break there. Um, however, not in uh, many seats which are held by uh, the Labour Party and some Liberal Democrats in Brexit voting areas. We have a little over a month, I think, to go until the election. I guess the polls are indicated that Tories are ahead, but do those nationwide polls count for much in England? Well, they count for something, um, and it's quite a substantial lead. In, in many polls, it's a double-digit lead. But the polls are not constituency by constituency. And this is a first-past-the-post system, a winner-takes-all take all system. Um, but what we can say is it's looking increasingly like a two-party race, uh, rather than uh, back in May when we saw sort of four parties all within touching distance of each other. So I think the Conservatives will feel comfortable now. They will not feel confident. And a lot of... Uh, of this election really depends on what happens in some of those leave voting areas that the Conservatives need to win if they're going to have the kind of comfortable majority Boris Johnson wants to get his deal through and uh, govern and legislate without substantial opposition. Thanks so much to Therese Raphael over in London. And now we turn to Damien Sassauer right here in New York. He's from Bloomberg Intelligence. We're going to talk about Hong Kong. Boy, this is not ending. Five months in and it gets even more violent. Now, this was the most violent day since the protests really started in earnest in June, David, but I mean, really what it means for me is, I mean, you've got 90 arrests, you've got, you know, um, you've got basically two people in critical condition, you have one man on the air who is doused in flames and set on fire. I mean, things have gotten really bad, but just what does that mean in so far as trade and China and the bigger picture goes? You know, we saw some data overnight. I mean, China's struggling. They're str struggling to stimulate growth. I mean, the credit extension is basically way, way slower than what you would expect for this time of year, even given the seasonal weakness. And look, we have fixed asset investment coming this week. We have IP. You know, if you you just look across the broader EM spectrum, it's been weak. I mean, Mexico and India reported today both weaker than expected. We expect more of the same on Wednesday. So how is this translating into the yuan, the strengths of the yuan, and for that matter, into U.S.-China trade negotiations? Yeah, it's really quite interesting. The yuan is actually one of the only major crosses that is up versus the dollar amidst this whole recent kind of progress in China-U.S. trade talks. But, you know, the fact remains, you know, after today, you've seen it go back through the seven, uh, the psychological seven handle. I think we're at 701, 702 now. And look, you know, I mean, it's just kind of a you know, a give and take back and forth between Trump tweets and whatever comes next in terms of the trade front. Hong Kong's in a recession already. Uh, their stock market took a real hit today, I guess not surprisingly off of this. To what extent does Hong Kong really affect the larger Chinese economy? Well, it's one of the largest hubs for air freight globally, right? I mean, it is. I mean, that airport's hugely business. It is I mean, widely considered to be the gate to mainland China. And so, you know, you're just looking at eight shares. I mean, we look at uh, the SH comp this morning. I'm struggling to break through that 3,000 barrier. You know, equity prices are struggling. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we're going to see more rate cuts coming out of China in the foreseeable future, David. I mean, I, 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 I don't see how they can get around it. Damien Cesar, always great to have him with us. And now we want to go over to uh, Madrid, to Maria Tadeo. I didn't think, Maria, they could get even more confusing in Spain, but I think they managed it yesterday in the elections. Well, it did, and the situation here is very messy. Yesterday night, there was an election. This was supposed to be the election that would end the deadlock four years without a stable government. But if you look at the results, it looks very, very difficult going forward for the Spanish prime minister, the socialist Pedro Sanchez, who won the election but lost seats. And most crucially, it's very unclear what kind of government he's going to be able to form, if any. If he turns to the left, he's running short of votes. If he tries to form 
form a grand coalition with its rival, the PP. That looks very, very unlikely. So at this point, unclear where he goes from here. Really not a good night. And what we're seeing is more fragmentation in the Spanish parliament, more nationalists entering the Spanish Congress, and a nation that's very tired, very frustrated by the political class here. Frustration. Did, is that what translated into the rise of the right? Because as I understand it, the right of center party actually gained popularity while the socialists actually lost. They did, and look, this is a really spectacular situation because this was a party that essentially did not exist a year ago. They made major gains yesterday. They almost doubled their number of seats, and there's two things that paid off for them. One is the fact that many Spaniards are now frustrated and tired. Four elections in four years, they feel the old traditional parties no longer work. And of course, the Catalan situation, which is still very much playing out in the Spanish political life. They promised they would be tough on the Catalans and also said they would ensure this nation would stay together. The idea of national unity is still paying off at the polls here, David. Okay, thank you so much to Maria today, reporting today from Madrid. And now let's get a check on how markets are reacting to today's top stories. Joining us now is Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, take me through this. When I first came in early this morning and said it was kind of Trump pouring cold water on trade, is that still the case? I think that that's still why we have stocks lower. Earlier today on the open, the S&P 500 down more than half a percent. At that point, on pace for its worst day in a month, that speaks to the big rally we've had five up weeks for the S&P 500. Now off of those lows, but nonetheless a little bit of a, a bearish tone, but also weighing on markets perhaps. It's kind of interesting what you and Damian Sassauer were talking about and what you said in particular about the Hang Seng down, I think, 2.6 percent. It's worst day since August. The Shanghai Composite down less, down 1.8 percent, but it's worst day since July. So when you see that kind of bearish activity in the Asian markets, it's a global uh, market system relay race. One of our uh, 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 contributors to Charting Futures likes to talk about Eric Dugan at 3D Capital, you have to look at all of the markets together. So if we continue to see weakness for those markets, EM markets down a second day in a row, it could bleed into the U.S. here. So help me, Abigail, sort out, on the one hand, what is sort of a direction because of things going on geopolitically or otherwise, as a part of supposed, supposed to just taking a breather. Because the equity markets have been really ramping up, and at some point they sell off a little bit. Here in the U.S., I would probably think we're seeing more of a breather because we've had a better than feared earnings season. Stocks up on that. There had been some hope around trade right now. Uh, uh, with the President Trump over the weekend saying that, you know, the U.S. has not agreed to those rollbacks of tariffs, uh, a little bit of a negative, but probably more of a breather uh, along the lines of what you're seeing. But if we see a continuation of this and President Trump saying that there's not going to be a, a trade deal or if, unfortunately, things get more violent in Hong Kong, you could see that start to weigh on the markets here, something to keep an eye on for sure. And not so much from the standpoint that it's going to hit the corporate profit outlook, but if you continue to see big declines in Asia, it could bleed into Europe and then the U.S. US, but that would probably take several days. Really helpful take on the markets. Thanks so much to Abigail Doolittle. And now we're going to turn to Mark Crumpton because he's here with Bloomberg First Word News. David, the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, says ex-White House Chief of Staff John Kelly and former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson tried to undermine President Trump. Nikki Haley says the two told her that when they resisted the president, they were trying to save the country. That's according to Haley's new book. U.S. Congressman Peter King is calling it quits after 14 terms. The New York Republican is a former chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. Congressman King is the 20th member of the party from the House to plan an exit next year. In a statement today, King said he intends to vote against President Trump's impeachment and support him for re-election in 2020. Responding to three weeks of mass protests, Chile's government plans to overhaul the constitution drawn up during the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. The interior minister says a proposal for the mechanism of reviving the constitution will be delivered in the next few days and the document will be drawn up within, quote, one or two years. A new constitution has been of the one, one of the main demands of protesters in Chile. Australia is bracing for another week of devastating brush fires. Three people have died. More than 150 homes have been destroyed. Huge trunks of the eastern seaboard and even parts of greater Sydney face what's called a catastrophic threat. There's a two-year drought in those areas. Conditions are expected to be hot and windy this week. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. 
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Coming up here, Hong Kong protests turn even more violent, paralyzing downtown and leaving two men in critical condition. We talk with Riva Gujan of Strike Stratfor. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Five months of protests in Hong Kong turned even more violent, with tear gas fired in downtown, one man shot at close range by police, and another man set on fire. Markets are reflecting the damage to the economy already in recession in Hong Kong. We welcome now Riva Gujon. She is Stratfor Vice President for Global Analysis, coming to us today from Austin, Texas. So, Riva, thank you for coming back with us. Give us a sense of what's going on in Hong Kong. It's been five months now. How, to what extent is this affecting China? China more broadly. Well, when we look at the Hong Kong situation, obviously you see the protests turning more violent and the the large the mass protests are are declining in number and you could at the surface just say okay, this is similar to the 2014 trajectory where we start to see the protests dwindle a bit and then the more violent elements come to the fore and then that could maybe work in favor of the Hong Kong authorities in cracking down more more effectively but that's not necessarily the case here remember that these grievances run very very deep and you still have broad popular support for the protests every reaction elicits another reaction and so more repressive police tactics are are going to only inflame the protests more police morale is very low and so Hong Kong authorities can't concede on key protest demands like an independent inquiry. So this just continues to burn. And, you know, as we, we see kind of global attention remain very fixated on the Hong Kong protests, um, of course, economically, this is t having a very big hit in Hong Kong itself. But, you know, there's still potential for this ble to bleed into the broader trade talks, well, especially as you see. That's Congress just what we ask. Does it bleed into it or are they siloed? Well, I think, of course, you know, Beijing wants to keep this very compartmentalized. But when we look at the White House, it's more selective. When it looks for leverage, it'll look at those peripheral issues and it'll seize on it to apply more pressure on Beijing. We saw this recently when we saw human rights sanctions levied against key Chinese tech firms over human rights abuses in Xinjiang province. So Hong Kong fits into that category. And even if President Trump wants to go for a trade deal and keep keep Hong Kong out of it, we still see a lot of bipartisan support in Congress that's going to keep bringing this issue to the forefront. So as much as the leaders may want to keep it siloed, that's much easier said than done. We're talking with Riva Gujan of Stratfor. So Riva, let's turn to another geopolitical issue that's, uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty. That's Spain. They had their elections yesterday. And if anything, it seems less certain after the election than before. What is going on in Spain? Yeah, not only did this election fail to break the gridlock, it resulted in even, even more fragmented parliament, which is something we were expecting. And so, you know, you have a very difficult situation for the Socialist Party. They can't look to their natural allies on the left, um, which did not perform very well. And the Ciudadanos Centrist Party essentially collapsed in this election. Um, and so while neither the left or the right really have the numbers to reach that 176 parliament, parliamentary majority that they need to form a government. That means they would have to look to smaller regional parties for support. But that's when you get into the politically toxic issue of dealing with the Catalan parties and you know who will be advocating for an independence referendum. And nobody really wants to touch that in mainstream Spanish politics. So this means we're going to have more gridlock, probably another election early next year. And while the Spanish government has been, you know, and the Spanish economy more broadly has been resilient to this political crisis, um, you know, now we're going to start to see more of that effect because, you know, we are seeing that slowdown in Spain taking effect amidst right. a much broader European slowdown. Um, so reforms are going to be much harder uh, right. to get through, obviously, in this political paralysis. And this just feeds into that wider European slowdown narrative. Which leads to the question of what's driving the uncertainty and, and the discontent in Spain, because as you just said, Riva, actually their economy is doing pretty well considering uh, where they are and considering where they have been. So it's, it doesn't seem to be economics. What is driving it? 
Well, you have, I mean, when you saw the selection result with the, a big win for the far-right Vox Party, which advocates a very centralist, nationalist uh, viewpoint for Spain, which is really a reaction to the the issue with Catalonia. And so, you know, you're seeing this this age-old conflict um, between the center and, and the secessionist regions in Spain playing out in its politics. And, you know, of course, there's still underlying economic tension and social tension that does not go away. Um, but it's the regional politics politics that is, is now playing to in favor of the more extreme parties. We're talking with Riva Bajan of Stratford. Let's have one more area, and that is the United Kingdom. We heard Nigel Farage come out today said, I'm not going to go after the Conservative Party. I will go after the Labor Party. Does that put Boris Johnson in a substantially stronger position? Yeah, I mean, you kind of see uh, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage doing their dance, right? And of course, there's the pre-electoral dance and the post-electoral <laughs> dance. And so right now, you know, you're, you, I think it's very notable that Nigel Farage has kind of softened his red lines in dealing with Boris Johnson, um, you know, and saying, OK, it's not about just throwing out the withdrawal agreement and going for a no-deal Brexit, but it's about keeping the transition period short. And so there's plenty of room for negotiation here. Of course, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in the election in this winner-takes-all system. But you can certainly see the potential for a coalition to emerge between uh, Boris Johnson's Conservative Party and Nigel Farage's Brexit Party. And they really do have the clearest direction for Brexit. So that is probably the most stable outcome um, if we see that emerge from this election result. Reva, one last short one. Let's assume for the moment, getting ahead of ourselves, that actually the Tories win the election. Does that make it clear that the Parliament will go along with Boris Johnson's plan on Brexit? Well, uh, it, it all depends on the actual numbers, right, um, and, and just how much of a lead they have. But again, if you do see enough support going to the Brexit Party and the Conservatives, remember Boris Johnson has gotten the furthest now with the withdrawal agreement that gets around some of the stickier points on the Northern Ireland issue. So certainly he, he has the best chance of, of delivering a Brexit outcome. Okay, many thanks to Riva Gujan. She's Stratfor Vice President for Global Analysis. Sticking with British politics, the conversation has been dominated by conservative attacks on labor spending plans. This morning on a building site outside of London, Bloomberg's European close anchor Guy Johnson caught up with Sajid Javid. He is Chancellor for the Exchequer, and that was after GDP data had shown growth in the third quarter. And he asked him whether his planning plans would boost GDP even more. We set out our fiscal rules, which show that in terms of day-to-day -day spending, it will always be in balance. We will, and I've, I've been very clear about this, we will sensibly borrow more to invest in economic infrastructure, but that is a whole world of difference between you know, our plans of sensible yep. investment in economic infrastructure versus Labour's plans, which is endless amounts of borrowing. But how much more will you borrow? We will, we, with the fiscal rules will keep borrowing under control. If we win the election, then we will have within weeks our first budget as a new government. And in that budget, you would expect to see the detail and the independent forecast from the OBR about the impact of our spending and tax decisions. And, and, that, and that's important. But to get there, we need to win this election and show, as we are, that we are the fiscally responsible party we always have been. And over the last uh, nine Nine years since we've been in office, we've seen this economy recover. Uh, to is, we've seen almost 20% of uh, growth in the economy in that period, yep. and uh, we've done far better than many of our competitors. But to keep that growth going, we need to have a fiscally responsible government, and only the Conservatives can offer that. Have you asked the Governor of the Bank of England to stay on? Will you ask the Governor of the Bank of England to stay on, given the uncertainty that exists at the moment? Uh, there's no need for an extension in the term of the Governor of the Bank of England. If we were to win this election, we can make a decision very, very quickly uh, on who the next Governor should be. And uh, if we win, we will act very quickly. That was UK Chancellor of the Exchequer Sajid Javid speaking with Bloomberg's Guy Johnson. Still ahead here, KKR formally approaches Walgreens Boots Alliance about a deal to take the company private. It could be the biggest ever leveraged buyout. It's our company in the crosshairs. It's next, and this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for our stock of the hour. Walgreens is the best performer in the S&P 500 today. The stock is popping higher by nearly 6% now on reports that KKR has formally approached the company about a deal to take it private. Kaylee Lines is here to explain it to us. Yeah, of course we got the news last week that a possible leverage buyout was going to happen. Yeah, there were rumors. There were rumors. The street didn't really buy it because it would be such a large deal. I mean, we're talking about a company with a market cap over $50 billion, $17 billion in debt. This would be far and away the largest leverage buyout in history. I mean, we're talking like $40 billion over and above the <laughs> one largest to date, which was $48 billion. So there is a question of can this really get done? Now that KKR is in the mix, apparently uh, preparing a formal proposal to give to Walgreens shareholders about this buyout, maybe it's being taken a little bit more seriously in the market today, but it's still likely that KKR is going to have to partner with someone here in order to really see through a buyout of this size. So it would be historic, potentially, yeah. and that's exciting. It's certainly exciting for the bankers involved. <laughs> Why does it make it a better company? Because I think Walgreens has sort of not been doing as well as, for example, CVS Health. Yeah. It, it hasn't. Walgreens has been a really big lagger this year. It's actually one of the worst performers in the Dow. And they've really been taking different strategy, different tact than, say, CVS, which has its Aetna acquisition, which has been vertically integrating. And Walgreens is really just doubling down on brick-and-mortar retail. Uh, it's partnering with Kroger, with Jenny Craig, things like that. But you're still seeing it struggle both in the front of the store with uh, competition for the likes of Amazon for things like shampoo, which you can now get delivered in a matter of hours. And then in the back of the store in the pharmacy business, you're seeing a lot of startups in that space and delivering pills to people's homes. And then also just there's been a public outcry over drug pricing in public and on Capitol Hill. And that weighs on their revenue as well because the drug prices just aren't picking up at the same rate that they were just a number of years ago. So that's weighing on the bottom line as well. So it is a really interesting question. I mean, what the return really could be for KKR or another private equity firm in this deal? What's the strategy here? And one of the questions I have to ask, maybe an unfair question, is how much of this is because they have a better mousetrap that they're developing as opposed to money's burning a hole in everybody's pocket? That is to say, there's an unlimited demand for debt, you know? Right. Uh, stake values are high. Uh, to what extent is it just, it just makes so much sense. You can structure a deal like this right now because the interest rates because are really low. Right, You exactly. know, And so, sure, you can put a lot of debt on the balance sheet. The question is, what are you going to do with all that money? I mean, certainly right now in this rate environment, there may be a little bit more incentive to do it now before mm -hmm. things turn around. And also, the fact, I mean, we're talking about Walgreens underperforming. It's down some 23% in the past year, so the valuation is a little bit more depressed, which makes it potentially more attractive active right now while the stock is weaker. So timing, you know, may be a factor here, but still, we don't know. This is, again, just according to people familiar with the matter. It's not necessarily a deal that is going to happen, but we know KKR is formally approaching them. So it's we'll got see everybody what really excited, though. It does. That's it for does, sure. Certainly. Okay. All right. <laughs> Many thanks to Kaylee Lyons. Up next, public hearings on impeachment begin on Wednesday down in Washington, with polls now indicating a sharp division across America falling right along party lines with the independent split in between. We talk with our political panel about what to expect live from New York. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television, and we are on Bloomberg Radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, House Democrats signal they may let some witnesses requested by Republicans testify at the impeachment hearings, but they'll be limited to those who have knowledge of President Trump's actions. There are at least two people on the Republican list who won't be invited, Joe Biden's son Hunter and the whistleblower. It's been one of the most violent days in Hong Kong since protests began in June. Fighting between police and demonstrators left downtown paralyzed. Police shot and wounded one protester. Meantime, a man said to have disagreed with protesters was set on fire. Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, warned protesters that violence won't help them achieve their goals. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson got an election boost from the economy. The UK dodged a recession in the third quarter by avoiding another contraction. The economy grew three-tenths of one percent between July and September. The figures were weaker than expected, and they showed the British economy had little momentum entering the fourth quarter. 
Elon Musk's SpaceX launched its second batch of 60 Starlink satellites today, taking another step toward its founder's vision of creating a network for space-based broadband internet service around the world. According to Musk, this service will be an important source of funding for the closely held company. SpaceX plans to continue launching Starlink satellites in batches. It aims to provide service to parts of the northern U.S. and Canada next year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. Impeachment is every bit as much about politics as it is about law. And thus far, it looks like America is just about as divided on impeachment as it is on so many other issues. Welcome now, Chris Wilson, WPA Intelligence founder and CEO. Mr. Wilson was director of research for Ted Cruz's presidential campaign in 2016. He joins us from Oklahoma City and from, Wilmington, and from Washington, Drew Littman, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, Shrek policy director. Mr. Littman served as Senator Al Franken's chief of staff. So welcome to both of you, great to have you with us. So let Thank me you. start. Let me start first of all uh, with uh, Chris. Chris, you're a pollster. Uh, the polls I've seen indicate, as I said, it's basically all the Democrats are for impeachment, all the Republicans are against it, and the independents are pretty much split down the middle. It is. You could almost take a, an overlay of impeachment with Trump approval, and it's almost exactly the same thing. If you approve of the job Donald Trump is doing, then you're against impeachment. If you think Donald Trump is doing a bad job, if you disapprove of him, if you're unfavorable toward him, then you're for impeachment. And it really has just become sort of a an anthem for that and I don't think there's much that it tells us and until there are until there's something significant that comes out and the selective leaks aren't doing it but something significant uh, sort of in a water Kate style uh, release from somebody internal I think you're going to see that continue to be the case. So Drew what are we expecting out of these public hearings are Democrats expecting expect as, as Chris just said sort of like Watergate this is a revolution we, a revelation we knew nothing about? Well, as a, as a staffer, I sat through the Senate Whitewater hearings, and the Whitewater hearings were a great example of the wrong way to do this. They were disconnected and detached, and the committee chairman, Senator D'Amato, chairman of the special committee, every morning would announce that that day you would see some incredible revelation that would blow the lid off the whole cover-up. He built expectations, and nothing ever really happened. I think Democrats have to be extremely disciplined, and they have to focus on advancing a narrative so the public understands what happened and not individually on getting tele on television, which, as you know, is what members usually think about when they're walking into a hearing room. So, Chris, is there something uh, beyond what uh, we've known so far that might come out? I mean, in this sense, in Watergate, for example, uh, there were all sorts of things about what the president knew, when he knew it, and things like that. Don't we sort of know the whole story here? We saw it in that modified transcript. We do. One of the first axioms of politics is never fire all your ammunition at once. And I really feel like that's sort of what Democrats did here is they is they took everything they had and they released it up front. And then they tried to selectively go back and release transcripts and maybe a little excerpt of a transcript here and there to back up information that they'd already released. And it just is it is a lot like Whitewater. I agree. That's a perfect analogy in that it's kind of there's no surprises here. And mine is a big surprise. You're not going to see anything change here. And I think what's going to happen, anybody who watches what's going on in Washington right now can predict the House is going to vote along party lines to impeach. The Senate is going to vote along party lines to reject that impeachment and not convict. And then we're going to move on to the elections in 2020. And I think the only people left kind of holding the bag here, the American public going, why did we just go through all this and not pass anything that actually helps us or has any sort of impact on America? And it's really going to be another bit of frustrating, creating uh, a visualization of the frustration that exists with Americans toward what goes on in Washington every day. So, Drew, you've sort of played for the other side, as it were, but explain to me, if you can, what the Republican strategy is in going after the whistleblower. We heard, for example, from Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina over the weekend saying, boy, this isn't going to work at all unless we hear from this whistleblower. This is what Senator Graham said. It's impossible to bring this case forward, in my view, fairly, without us knowing who the whistleblower is and having a chance to cross-examine them about any biases that they may have. So if they don't call the whistleblower in the House, this thing is dead on arrival in the Senate. So, Drew, again, I'm sort of being unfair, asking you to explain what the other side is doing here. But suppose you found out that the whistleblower was totally biased. What difference does it make about what the president did or, for that matter, why he did it? 
Well, none. I think the Republicans are firing up everything they can. And, and Senator Graham, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, is a smart lawyer, but this is a sideshow. Everything that the whistleblower claimed has been corroborated by people who we know have direct knowledge. They've been interviewed, some of them have spoken publicly, complete transcripts have been published, and they'll all testify again. So the whistleblower is not really relevant at this point. Chris, it is a sideshow exactly the point? Because if we can sort of muddy the water some, then there's not a clean kill, as it were? Well, I'm going to keep still on Drew's analogy because I think the Whitewater case is a good example of this. Is what you looked at Democrats do is they tried to, to they tried to make the case about Ken Starr and him being a biased, unfair arbiter. And I think that's what exists here with the whistleblower. Anyone's been paying attention uh, knows who this person is now. They know they ha that he has a very uh, partisan, hardcore Democrat activist background. And I think that the thinking on the Republican side is they make it about him and who he is and why he brought this forward that it will make the case less compelling. Uh, Democrats are wisely trying to keep it away. From that and make it about the people who testified afterwards, and I, I do think it is—it's a bit of a sideshow. But if that's if that coming out of Whitewater, you saw Ken Starr was really the one who had the biggest negative sur impression surrounding him, and I think that's the same thing that Republicans are trying to do here with the whistleblower. Chris, one last thought about Peter King. That's the other big news here in New York, at least yeah. long-term, long-term Republican congressman from Long Island has announced he's not going to re-up. There's quite a few Republican congressmen who are not going to go for re-election. Is that basically reflecting that they don't think that the Republicans have? Have much of a chance of taking the House, so they don't want to be in a minority anymore. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit of that, just to, to speak candidly. I think it is also, look, as you said, King's been in the House a long time, and he said that he was sick of the commute. And, uh, you know, we've all made that trip back and forth between D.C. and New York. And I can't imagine doing it every week for as long as he has without getting frustrated with it myself. But, no, being in the minority is no fun, and I think most Republicans look at 2020 as an opportunity, but maybe not a, not a real strong one. But most Republicans look at 22 as the chance to take the House back. And that being the case, it's probably uh, it does. Uh, it's a lot different to be to serve in the minority than it is in the majority, and probably making that trip became a little bit longer than it was whenever you were in the majority. Uh, Drew, wrap this all up from the Democrat side. Uh, not about the presidential race, but specifically about the Senate and the House. How confident are you the Democrats could take back the Senate or hold the House? Hold the House very confident, expand their lead very confident. The gerrymandering decision in North Carolina last week helps a bit there. The Senate, I don't know, but I think the consequences of impeachment will be greater for people like Susan Collins in the Senate, even though obviously they're not part of this frontline hearing uh, uh, sequence, uh, than it will be for Democratic House members, even in swing districts. It's the Republicans in blue states who are up in 2020, I think, who have to be sweating this. Okay, many thanks to our political panel of Drew Lippman and Chris Wilson. Coming up, 250,000 veterans leave the military every year, and many have real difficulty translating their skills and experience into the private sector. On this Veterans Day, we talk with a vet who's created a new way of helping them make that transition. That's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. More than 4 million veterans have left the military since 9-11, and 250,000 leave every single year. They've acquired skills and experience that can be extremely useful in the private sector, but figuring out how to make that translation is not always easy, either for the veterans or for employers. A new startup company is trying to help them with that translation, founded by a Navy veteran who was a bomb disposal officer and commanded a bomb squad battalion. Mike Slaw is the founder of Shift, and he comes to us today from San Francisco. So welcome. Good to have you with us, Mike. Thank you so much, David. Uh, if I you... could just start by saying happy Veterans Day to everybody who came before me and everybody still serving. As a veteran myself, it's always been a very special holiday for me. So God bless those of you who are still out there on the front lines. Yeah, well said. And it's a special day, really, for the entire country to honor those who've served in the armed forces. So give us a sense. You have made this transition from the military back into civilian life. Give us some sense of what the challenges are for our vets. Well, I mean, you think about it this way. When you're separating from the military, like you said, one of the 250,000 people who make this transition every single year, you just want to know at first what's possible. You want to know how your skills translate. You want to know how sometimes very unique experiences might translate to something that might be of value to a future employer. 
And so there's structural challenges with transitioning from the military. If you want to live in New York City or you want to live in San Francisco, no matter who you are, it's hard to get a job when you're sitting on base in Fort Benning, Georgia, or Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. But beyond that, when we're talking to employers that we work with to hire more veterans, we always challenge them to look around the table. And if everybody around the table has the same exact experience, your answers to the problems that you're trying to solve might look increasingly the same. So we're not asking employers that we work with to lower the bar necessarily, but just to have conversations and to interview vets. We think vets are the most diverse workforce on the planet. It's people who have, who have worked with people from every city and state in America, and they figured out how to communicate effectively and, and, and work in very difficult, ambiguous environments and accomplish the goal. So, so give us some sense of what the military does for vet, veterans like you in making that transition. I mean, the unemployment, obviously, going back to 2008, 2009, was quite high for vets. It's come down significantly as unemployment overall has come down in this society. Yeah, so the military is actually, we, when, we, when we look at some of the leadership, there's this very, I guess it's a small but growing movement of people who want to do more around military transition. And there's all of these very nascent but interesting initiatives that are starting to invest more uh, up to a year out prior to somebody separating from military service. The initiative that we're launching today is called Shift Pathways, and it, it is reduced tech education for military veterans. What we've done is help discover veterans uh, which pathway might fit best for them. And then through our partner, EdAid, we've launched a new fund that completely finances 100% of the upfront tuition at Lambda School, a world-class technology skill academy. At the end of this program, veterans don't pay a single dime until they're employed in a high-paying job in industry. And their repayment into this fund is the very thing that powers the next veteran in their footsteps to access this critical upskilling and reskilling curriculum. It picks up where the GI Bill leaves off. It sounds like a great program. Why isn't the government doing that? That sounds sort of like the GI Bill after World War II. Why isn't the government doing exactly what you're doing right now? Well, let's be clear, the GI Bill is this transformative initiative. And I always talk to veterans and say, if the GI Bill and, and accessing traditional college makes sense for you and it can get you to the outcome that you want, then you should definitely go for it. It's an entitlement. It's something that you've earned. But many times, it doesn't necessarily work out that way because a veteran didn't get the outcome that they want through attending a traditional university. Or they've given that entitlement to their spouse or to their family. And so when we think about the initiative that we're doing right now in partnership with EdAid and Lambda School, we think it might be just a glimpse into what the future of education could look like for all of us. Attend world-class, concentrated education that only focuses on skills. Do it anywhere you want in the world. It's completely interest-free. You only pay back if you actually get a high-paying job in industry. And the best of all, you're paying back money into a fund that powers the next person. And funds are fenced for that very purpose. So, so the reason why, why I'm excited to announce it. Yeah, I can tell, tell why you would be excited to announce it. So finally, Mike, give us a sense for Shift overall, the overall company, what your goal is. You talk about 250,000 vets coming back every year. What's the market that you think is available for Shift? How big can you get? Yeah, when, we, when we think about Shift, there's 250,000 people who leave service every year. But I look to some of these world-class companies that serve the military community so well, like USAA. And it's a category-defining brand around financial services for the military. A career change company for military veterans is not only something that we all want to exist, but I think society wants it to exist as well. But I think society knows that a company that allows people to upskill and reskill and improve their careers over the course of many years is something that society needs as well. Okay, many thanks to Mike Slaw. He's the founder of Shift, and he's a Navy veteran, and he's joining us on this Veterans Day from San Francisco. Great to have you with us, Mike. Now we have some breaking news. WeWork is in talks to hire T-Mobile CEO John Legere as its new CEO. That's according to Dow Jones. Shares of T-Mobile and Sprint are both slumping on the news. Legere is said to get team is, is supposed to be trying to get T-Mobile's merger with Sprint approved. We're going to bring you any more headlines as they develop in this really important breaking story. Coming up. Linda Lacewell, superintendent of the New York Department of Financial Services, joins us. She'll explain her investigation into Goldman Sachs over its Apple card. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Recapping that breaking news, WeWork is said to be in talks to hire T-Mobile CEO John Legere as its new CEO. As we know, John has been really trying to get the merger of T-Mobile and Sprint through the FCC as well as the Department of Justice for some time. They seem to be making some progress in that. But now Dow Jones, at least, is reporting that he is in talks with WeWork as they try to re redo WeWork. And you, as a practical matter, both stocks, T-Mobile and Sprint, are down on the news. We'll continue to bring news on that as it develops but potentially big news in the telecommunications industry. But right now, we want to turn to big news over the weekend, and that is about algorithms and whether they can discriminate. It's a question that Congress has been asking for some time, and it came, uh, it came to the fore over the weekend with claims that two prominent tech figures, including the co-founder of Apple, claimed that their wives had received far lower credit limits on their Apple cards. The New York State regulator promptly announced an investigation, and we welcome her now back to Bloomberg. So, Madam Speaker, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. So you're doing this investigation. What do we know about this at this point? I mean, we have some reporting on the Bloomberg. What do you know? Well, we know that there was a viral tweet on Twitter over the weekend. It actually went on for days. And many people responded making the same claim, which is that they had applied or their wives had applied for the Apple card backed by Goldman Sachs and that the woman was treated differently than the man and either was denied or received a lower credit limit, even though her credit score was higher. Now, the, the viral tweet, as I understand it, came from David Heinemeyer Hansen, who's yes. a Danish tech uh, uh, entrepreneur. He's a coder and things like that. Um, I understand that, in fact, he got a letter from Apple, no, actually from Goldman, explaining why. Have you seen that letter? Do you know what, why Goldman says this happened? Well, we're going to find out what Goldman has mm -hmm. to say, because they did reach out to us, and we're already engaged in dialogue with them so that they can walk through and explain to us how the algorithm works. Because... One of the main problems here is an algorithm is a black box, mm -hmm. and it's a black box for consumers, which is a problem. It cannot also be a black box for the user, Goldman or Apple. They need to understand how it works, how it's being applied, and make sure that it's not discriminatory in impact, even if that wasn't the intent. Now, one thing I've heard is that it may be a situation in which uh, you have a husband and wife, but it also be a father and a son, where they're both on the same card. But in fact, the person responsible for the credit is the father or the husband. And so their credit rating, according to regulators, is different from the other person on the, on the related card. Does that happen, in fact? Well, it does happen sometimes. It's not clear yet what happens here because Apple sent out a notice or Goldman sent out a notice to its consumers and users saying that, in fact, they look at each person yes. separately. So it remains to be seen how the card works in operation here, and that's exactly what we're going to get to the bottom of. Exactly. Goldman did have a statement saying it. we'd look at each individual. We look, don't look at it as a family. Uh, but if, in fact, they look at each individual separately, is it possible that two people who are related, even husband and wife, could have very different credit worthiness based on their history in the past and whether they were responsible for paying the bills? Yes, it's possible. It depends on the factors that are being looked to, and that's what we need to determine since this algorithm is being used in place place of human beings or disclosed criteria to make credit decisions, we need to see exactly how it's working. How do you go about an investigation like this? How do you investigate an algorithm? Well, of course, it's not the algorithm that <laughs> we're investigating, although that, that is definitely a good question. Uh, the user of the algorithm has a responsibility to test the product, which there are ways of doing, to make sure that it's operating fairly. And there ought to be some kind of disclosure to the consumer about why the decision is being made either to deny or to give a lower credit rating. And just as importantly, the customer service representatives need to understand how it's working. And, and according to this traffic over the weekend, the customer service representatives themselves had no way of explaining. They just said, it's the algorithm. Well, it's interesting because from your point of view, I suppose, if people know what the rules are, they can modify their behavior to adjust them. And if we don't know what the rules are, it's sort of hard to know uh, exactly what we can do to improve our situation. Well, that's a really good point. I mean, credit rating agencies disclose to uh, applicants of various you know, credit products why they were denied. And people do learn accordingly and can become more financially responsible. The point here is we don't know why the decision was made, and that's what we need to learn. We're talking with Linda Lacewell here, and she's responsible for really supervising financial institutions in the state of New York. Uh, one of the things that was reported, at least in the Bloomberg report, is that uh, the husband and the wife had different credit scores, and maybe the wife had a better credit score. But one of the things that I'm told is credit score does not necessarily translate into credit worthiness. Is that true? There's are two different ideas? I think it depends on who's doing the product, who's, who's providing the product, and how they decide to do it. 
I think, again, the importance is transparency to consumers, fairness to consumers, because we're all consumers. There's no us over here and consumers over there. Everybody deserves to understand why these decisions are being made to offer or not offer financial products and services to them. Give us a sense of what the New York statute is that you're enforcing. I mean, what, what is required uh, of a, somebody who extends credit? Well, we have a variety of statutes. Certainly discrimination, including discriminatory uh, impact is illegal under the New York State Human Services Law, and that includes two extensions of credit. And the financial services law and the banking law require that consumers be treated fairly, without discrimination, and be treated equally in terms of consumer protection. This is an investigation that just started, so we don't know what you'll ultimately find. It may be that it's totally innocent. But if, in fact, you found violations, what's the sort of penalty that's possible? Well, we have a range of options available to us. I don't want to prejudge anything, of yes, course, right. uh, but there is an ability to impose fines, there's an ability to get restitution if consumers were affected. Uh, we do license Goldman Bank, and that's really the core of our jurisdiction. Okay, thank you so very much. Really good to have you with us. We're going to have more with the New York Superintendent of Financial Services, Linda A. Lacewell. That's coming up in our second hour, and that'll be on Bloomberg Radio. Recapping that breaking news now, WeWork is said to be in talks to hire T-Mobile CEO John Legere as its new CEO. Once again, of course, Mr. Legere has been working hard on getting T-Mobile Sprint merger through, but and then the stocks of both companies right now are down on this report coming from Dow Jones. We're going to continue to cover that as it develops. We'll bring you any more headlines in this very important potential story involving telecommunications. This is Balance of Power, and we're on Bloomberg Television and on radio.